The reading is taken from Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 26, which can be found on page 2 of the Church Bibles. Genesis chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed, that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. George, thank you very much for reading that. If you were here last week, then we imagined a conversation out of the first four chapters of the book of Genesis. We imagined a conversation between Adam and Eve and their third child, Seth. Uh, We'll get to the story in November and December, but imagine a confused little boy with a future of trying to make the best of a ruined world, asking his parents what went wrong. That's where we started last week. And last week, we heard about God and his world. That is point one on the the handouts for today. It's really last week's sermon, so we won't be there for long. But Seth, like us, lives in a world that was created. That is the consistent claim of the Bible. This universe did not happen by random chance. It has behind it a creative and loving personality. Somebody enormously powerful made all of this. That's what we spent all the time on last week. God created all of this, Seth, simply by speaking. So this world, it should reflect his character. This world should be perfect and ordered and fruitful. And Seth, as you notice, as we notice, the world is not always like that. Well, so much we are responding to what is deeply wrong in our world and has gone wrong. We're right to feel like that. But imagine then that Seth does what children do and generates a second question. So they've been talking about the, the whole universe and the sun and the sky and the mountains and the sea and the elephants. And then Seth turns to look at his parents and at himself. What am I? Given what went wrong, what went wrong with the world, what am I now? 
What is a human being? What are we doing on this planet? Are we just here to ruin it? Is that our function to pollute and steal our way across the the blank canvas that God left us with? What are we? And Genesis 1 verse 26 on page 2 is the astonishing answer. Verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. What am I? You are like God. It's an astonishing thing for a a dad to say to a child. Children don't normally need help in self-importance. You are like God. It's an extraordinary thing to claim about a, a small, hairless ape. Good at thumbs and standing up but that is not enough, you would have thought, to be God. We are so fragile, so vulnerable. Our children are so dependent for years after the baby lion or the baby wolf is a threat to them. But you, Seth, you are like God. And we um, we skipped over last week the way that the six days of creation in Genesis 1, they are bizarrely imbalanced when you think about it. There's nothing neutral about this telling at all. The six days, it focuses on a place for us to live and on food for us to eat. That's day three. And on day four, when galaxies are made, their purpose, just turn back for this, verse 14, their purpose is given like it's the the specs on the new iPhone. Verse 14, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. Isn't that an odd thing to say? Billions of colossal balls of fire, impossibly far away, and they will be your clock and your calendar and your torch. Isn't that extraordinary? Then on day six, the the land is filled. That was the pattern we said. Days one to three, you form the the blank canvas, and then you fill it on each day wonderfully. And on day six, here come all the animals in their extraordinary variety. Verse 24, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth. And verse 25, God saw that it was good, and that was job done on every other day. Three spaces formed, three spaces filled. But strangely, day six doesn't end. Could easily fit us in there, couldn't you? Uh, Every type of animal after their own kind, here's just one more. But day six, verse 24, sorry, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And it is only once there is one more species, one final um, construction of, of skin and bones, only then, six verses later, verse 31, does God see everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And then there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So that is our, our very simple main point today, Um, Point two on the handout, uh, but we'll develop the implications for the time we have. It's the answer to what am I? The answer is you are different from everything else in God's creation because you, human being, are made in God's likeness. See, verse 26 stands out in the chapter massively. Uh, Everything else about Genesis chapter 1 and God's power, it has shouted that nothing in creation is like God at all. God is the only one who exists without process or beginning, and everything else there, it exists because he wanted it to. It's hard to imagine a more profound division, a deeper unlikeness between things that were created and the one who created them. But then he makes just one more. And physically, to look at it, it's the same. It's made of the same stuff. 
Uh, physically a very similar creature, but he says about this one, let us make mankind in our image, after our likeness. Not like the rocks, not like the waters, not like uh, simple chemistry, not like the birds and the fish, not like animals at all, but different. And the, the words used in verse 26, image and likeness, they are the kind of words normally used in a, a palace or a temple. Um, where maybe you have the divine pharaoh of Egypt, and you say, yes, he is the image of God. That's what they believed about him. Uh, or you go in the temple and you see the, the 20 foot tall, gold covered statue of Marduk, and you say, that is the likeness of a God. And because the statue is here, we know that God is here. And the author of Genesis takes those words and uses them of, of little boy Seth, picking his nose, trying to work out what has happened to his world. Every single one of us, a representative vision of God, an image, a likeness. And the, the two jobs, basic jobs that are given to human beings in verse 26 and verse 28, they reinforce this. If you were here last week, they should sound familiar. Let's look at it in verse 28. God blessed them and God said to them, first job, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There's one job, fill, and then second job, um, subdue it and have dominion over sea, heavens, and earth. Those two things, those are God's job description. Um, the creator is the boss. That was clear last week. He's the king. And fill and subdue, sorry, the other way around, fill and subdue were the, the two aspects of his work. Days one to three, he subdues darkness and formlessness. And he rules until you have three ordered spaces for things to live in. And then days four to six, he fills each one. We are God's likeness with God's job to do, fill and rule. That is an, an utterly crazy thing to claim about a tiny, weak, fragile ape, isn't it? But actually, with, with only a, a tiny handful of exceptions, every human being has noticed the same thing. And even the ones who deny this loudly tend to live as if it was true. The, the strange double-mindedness of trying to be a truly secular, atheistic person in a world that feels like someone made it, with a body and a mind and, a, and a emotions and feelings that feel like it was made for us. We said last week, the universe feels designed. Well, this week, we need to add, the universe feels designed for us doesn't it? And uh, someone like Richard Dawkins said, everyone has a favorite celebrity atheist, he's mine. Uh, someone like Richard Dawkins is happy to mock that idea when he meets it. Someone uh, in one of his books, he says, someone tried to prove to him that God made the world from how good bananas are. Um, and, uh, and it goes like this, not only do bananas taste great, but they also have color-coded wrappers um, green, which says not ready, and, and brown says you're too late, and yellow says just right. Um, they also have a sort of easy open tab on them, don't they? Uh, and the, um, the guy had written to Richard Dawkins saying, and they curve into our mouths nicely. Don't know, God exists. Um, and the, the professor goes after them, as you would imagine that he would. Um, not every appearance of design has to be explained by a designer. That's true, isn't it? But Richard Dawkins, just like the rest of us, he lives as if he mattered. Uh, Richard Dawkins should believe that Richard Dawkins is just a meaningless sack of chemicals. He says the universe is pitiless and indifferent to us. And yet he cares so visibly when someone disagrees with him. Why should he care? And he wants significance and beauty and purpose and meaning and love. Every one of us lives like the hero in a meaningful story. Every single one of us lives uh, as if human life mattered 
and reacts to death as if human life mattered. This morning, there are many people here grieving for someone we knew who has died. And at all the, the horror and tragedy of a life cut short at 25. But Eliot spent the time before his death seeking to explain all that to the people who loved him. Isn't that a good use of your last weeks and months? And Eliot's worldview is utterly, utterly different from the emptiness of secularism. Life matters. Life matters. Eliot matters far more than any collection of chemicals. Be a horrible idea with no um, meaning in it for anyone grieving. But death is not the end. Eliot was keen to let everyone know before he died because he is made in the image of God and he is with God now and will be raised by the God who made him. And we all, unless we fight really hard against that, believe that about ourselves and live as if that was true and react to those we love as if that was the way the world was. Every one of us lives like the hero in a meaningful story. Every one of us reacts to death as if life mattered. Every one of us takes for granted a world that provides everything we need to flourish and grow and gets cross and offended if anything gets in our way and steps on our toes. Um, I wonder if this is one reason why the climate, climate crisis movement is so emotionally powerful. Um, if you are a, a secular atheist, well, then there's no logical reason why the earth should be hospitable to you at all. If we're just a, a roll of the dice and we happen to have landed on a planet that after we rolled the dice a million times, we got sixes every single time and ended up on a planet fine-tuned for our comfort, then to ruin that through carelessness and greed. See the anger? That exposes the way that every one of us lives as if Genesis 1 was true, even while we shout that we don't think it is. And the, the Bible's answer, not that the Bible really argues for it here, that we'd need to go probably to somewhere else for that, but the Bible's answer is simply that the appearance is the reality. Every human being that has ever lived was not wrong, feels designed because it is designed, and you feel significant because you are. And we are like God, and he created the universe to place you in it. And I want to look at the implications. I want to look at the, the um, positive implications first, which are that you and I and every human being, we are far more than we dream. See, the truly radical thing here in Moses' world, when this is being written up, is that this is true of all of us. I mentioned Pharaoh. Pharaoh would have had no trouble believing he was in the image of God. That's what he'd been told since he was born. It's how everyone treated him. The Pharaoh, the emperor, they were important in that way. But the slave making bricks without straw, he's not important. She's not important. They're not valuable in that way. But here in the Bible, from the very beginning, let us make mankind in our image. And so that there would be no misunderstandings about what God means in verse 26 and verse 27, the single most visible distinction within human beings is mentioned here explicitly. So verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. I'm reading a book at the moment about um, how gender-neutral pronouns are not always neutral. Not that they shouldn't be or couldn't be, the book isn't saying, but that in general, we tend to read man and him as if it just meant male. Well, there is no chance for that misunderstanding here, is there? Man, in God's own image, what does that mean? It means male and female, created in the image of God. And there'll be time, as I said just now uh, earlier, but there'll be time in future weeks to talk about whether that means that sex and gender are not real, as some people are claiming, or whether men and women are just the same in every way. But starting here with the most obvious visible difference in our species, men and women, 
God says all of us are in his image. Whatever else divides us this morning, we share that, male or female, color or age or height or ability or background or family or country or politics or occupation or choices, whoever we are in the image of God which is the death of all the isms, isn't it? Death of all racism and sexism and classism and able-bodyism and prejudice and chauvinism of every kind. It dies here. Uh, If I am more than I could ever dream, if I am a representative of God tasked with his work as a Lord over creation in his place to rule and to fill as he did, if I am that and so are you, well, then no other difference can dilute our shared status. We are equal in the most profound possible way, if this is true of us. And this this feels obvious to us. It feels right to us, doesn't it? Even though none of us lives it consistently. But in Moses' world, it had a radical edge to it. Again, here is the the crazy double-mindedness of trying to live as a secular atheist in a world like ours. Um, There's a a new book out by Tom Holland called Dominion, The Making of the the Western Mind. And someone who heard I was speaking on these verses put me onto it. Um, And Tom Holland writes as a secularist, and he writes to tell us how our mind was formed, how the the values that we share if we are Western people, how they were all formed. And he, he went back to classical civilization, looking for our roots before, um, he was slightly hoping, before Christianity ruined everything. And he found that everything he believed as a secular materialist actually came from Christianity. So in everything that he liked and valued and thought was good about what he believed, he found actually came from Christianity. He says Christianity is the greatest revolutionary movement says it's behind secularism, civil rights, the Beatles, apparently, um, and hashtag me too. And uh, he finds, uh, I'm told, I haven't read the book yet, it's only Thursday, uh, this is based on some reviews, but he says he finds two deeply subversive issues, two deeply subversive ideas at the very heart of Christianity. And the first is that all people are equal. And the second is that the weak are heroic says the first idea is there in Genesis, that God created every man and woman in his image, giving an inherent dignity to every human. And the second, he says, is there in the death of Jesus on the cross. And uh, his historical point is that the ancient world thought the emperor was a god, but that the weak and the needy were disposable. And then Christianity came and told us that we were all equal. Now, what a radical difference that would make if I actually lived consistently the way that this verse says I should. Um, Just, you don't have to go many days back in my week, the the man behind the bar who I got angry with on Wednesday because the AA app wouldn't give me 10% off breakfast. 67p, I was out of pocket. Would I have reined in the anger if it had been a a friend's daughter doing work experience behind the bar? Probably, I think I would, out of respect to her and her parents. Or if a a celebrity uh, or a royal happened to be, you know, undercover in the Toby Toby Carvery bar. But the guy who was behind the till, who I don't think was a celebrity or a royal, uh, he is the lord of creation. Stars and planets were created so that he could tell the time. And he rules with me over everything that God made as the deputy of the creator of everything. And you just roll that out across every human being. The sex trafficked woman is made in the image of God, as are those who um, star in pornography, normally treated appallingly and always valued less than the equal lords of the universe that they really are. 
In fact, Tom Holland, he sees hashtag me too as an attempt to reimpose Christian sexual morality without admitting that it's really sexual morality. He says it, it is Puritan ethics. Puritan ethics to say that men have no rights over women's bodies. Says that in the 60s, it was the 60s that said men had the right to harass women. And it's Christianity that makes us feel that is wrong. Now, again, I haven't read the book yet, but there is a fascinating overturning of the historical narrative in our culture, isn't it? And you see this most clearly when people are at their weakest, whether that is about civil rights or refugees or all of those people who have no power to make us treat them well. Very strange to be a secular atheist, to deny Genesis 1, but to live like Genesis 1 was true. And and you can see that again in the discomfort when somebody starts talking about the logical consequences of a truly secular worldview. So it's not owned publicly very often, but you see it most clearly in somebody like um, the famous atheist, ethicist Peter Singer. So Peter Singer is a, a controversial figure, but in many ways he is simply thinking through to the end point what most of our friends and colleagues claim to believe. If you begin a conversation with, I think, really, we're here by chance, and we're just uh, animals, really, clever animals, and we're, we're just no more significant than anything else, really, on this planet, we'll think that through to its end point, and you get somebody like Peter Singer. He says that in his ethical work, he's not really trying to lower the rights of human beings. He says he's simply trying to raise the rights of animals. But the the consequences are these. If human beings are just clever animals, then there's nothing unique about us, and there's no reason to value all human life as more than all animal life. And he'd say it is the the cleverness, the rationality, autonomy, and self-consciousness that determines value. So he would argue that birth is an arbitrary place to start human rights. Say that the newborn baby is no more rational and autonomous than she or he was a week earlier. So I'm told he would legislate to legalize the killing of children up to about the age of two. Uh, And a a disability or a, a mental incapacity pushes that as the right choice. And weakness, particularly the weakness of old age that takes away rationality and autonomy and self-consciousness, why, why would we more, be more concerned for one physical creature over against a, a very autonomous chimpanzee? And he's, a, he's had a long career teaching these ideas and argued consistently, I think, bravely, for the logical consequences of rejecting Genesis chapter 1, with the, um, the only exception of his mother, who suffers from dementia. Uh, Though I've read two different accounts more recently of what he feels about that. There's one uh, where in an interview he just said it's different when it's your mother. Which again is the the being trapped with views that deny Genesis 1, but a a body and a soul and feelings and values that say Genesis 1 should be true. But um, then I read something different that says uh, his sister has made very certain that the great ethicist is never solely responsible for decisions about his own mother. And you'd see why, wouldn't you? The huge value of every single human person, not just a super-evolved ape, but spiritually different, unique, like God. We are more than we dream. But I also want us to notice a second area of implications, that this isn't just a blank check on our wildest self-important boast. So we are also less than we boast. Here's what I think is strange. I think even as atheism has pushed down on our unique status as human beings and pretended to think that we're no more than animals, um, even as it's done that, it has pushed down faster and harder on the status of God himself. Though that isn't unique to modern secular societies. When Genesis was written, everybody believed in gods, but those gods that they believed in, they were gods that you made for yourself and that you controlled 
by giving them the right offerings at the right time, which is not actually so different from today. Uh, We live with Genesis 1 values, uh, without explicit Genesis 1 beliefs, but actually most people say there must be a God because, well, yesterday someone said to me, without God, what is life all about? But we boast, we demand that that God leaves us alone to be human. Don't interfere with my human autonomy. That's the sort of thing we say and feel. There's a a devastating visual aid in Jeremiah chapter 18. We won't turn to it, but it it happened to be my morning Bible reading one day this week. And uh, God says to Jeremiah, go to the potter's house. And Jeremiah goes, and uh, the potter is doing his thing on the wheel with the the squishy clay. And one of the pots, it goes wrong. Uh, Too much of a, a lean or a lip or a bulge. And the potter simply reworks it into something else, whatever seemed good to the potter. And God says to Jeremiah, go tell the people, can I not do with you as this potter has done? Like clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. And we, we scream no from the very depth of our being. Even somebody who thinks that blind, pitiless chance has pull chemicals together through millions of years of dice rolling, and that all we are is just a sort of vehicle for genetic chemistry and replication. Even they, who I guess should believe that we are clay only, more than anybody else, want to be independent of any superior force. Genesis 1 says that we are more valuable than anything God made, separate from the other creatures that we resemble, more like God who made everything, more like God than all the other things that he made. But we are still a made thing, still a creature, still part of day six. We weren't there before day one began. Made, did you notice, in just the same way. Verse 26, God decided... So he said, and here we are, which has huge implications for how we relate to him. And I spoke about some of those last week. If he holds us in existence simply because he wants to, how far do we think we'll get by by shaking our tiny fists at him? But I want to finish with two other implications of how we're less than we boast and how that relates to how we live And first of all, how we rule this planet. So these verses, there's a command in there, isn't there? A command to have dominion over fish and birds and animals, to rule and subdue the earth. And people who care about this planet have for many years, long before the the current crisis, have pointed to these verses as the problem with what's gone wrong with our environment. They say human entitlement is the problem, And the Bible gives it to us on a plate, tells us to misuse and destroy the planet whenever and however we want. Except, of course, that properly understood, it says no such thing. We are not here independent and autonomous rulers of creation. We are in the image of God. And we rule for God, under God, like God, in the way that he rules. And just from from Genesis 1, how does he rule? Well, he subdues and he fills. And the purpose we're given is to continue what he started in his world, not ours, to his ends and his standards. And by day six, the world that God made is ordered and stable and full of life according to its kinds. There's no call for species extinction there. And the character of God's rule, that should be the character of human rule. One, um, one Extinction Rebellion friend of mine, he fears that the Bible is part of the problem, but he also thinks that the solutions should be so simple. A conversation I had with him, he just said, look, politicians, they could so easily make the changes that would save the planet. When really the Bible is the solution, but the changes are very, very difficult because they go so deeply into our hearts. No other species could ruin the planet. 
only the ones that God put here to care for it. And the problem is human greed, not technology. The problem is greed and selfishness and fear. But when the Bible calls us to rule like God, well, it has in mind the God who loves what he made and seeks to bless it and make it very good. That's Genesis 1. And who, as we've been reading and singing about in Jesus, takes on the flesh of a creature in order to die and rescue the things that we have made, he had made. That's the kind of rule that God models and demonstrates. Final implication, if this is who we are, human beings in the image of God, then just think about when we are most human. When are we most human? What is it to be most like a human being? Well, it is not when we ignore God and live apart from him. It's not when we assert our freedom against him, do what we want. We are most human when we are most like God and most animal when we turn away from God. It's when we reflect his character most clearly, which is why the New Testament says the kind of things we've been saying this morning about Jesus. Jesus as the most human being, most human person ever to live in his kindness, his gentleness, his self-sacrifice. Those are not um, signs that he is inhuman. Those are what humanity is supposed to be. Jesus, my brother, your brother in his humanity, who calls you to be like him. That's not a call to be less yourself, uh, to be restricted. It's a call to return to what humanity was supposed to be as the Lord's over all creation. And his mercy and his forgiveness is there to help us and to restore what we should have been. Let me lead us in a prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for sending him as the perfect image of you. Thank you that in his humanity we see how we should be. And you know our weakness, you know our failures. And we ask our Father that you would turn our thoughts towards you and help us to live in your world as your deputies, truly and honestly serving you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.